in times of crises, the field of orthopedic surgery can really distinguish itself. And in fact, it comes, as we all know, out of war surgery, out of general uh, barbarian war surgery. Uh, the field of orthopedics has uh, arisen. And I'd like to ask our dear friend and colleague Cliff Jones to come up here. Um, even as civilians, through the efforts of the Orthopedic Trauma Association, our academy, uh, and as leaders, uh, we've had a chance to now, as civilians, uh, try to express our gratitude towards our men and women in uniform who've been injured. And again, it's in these uh, times when perhaps the field of orthopedics uh, can rise and advance itself uh, by gaining new insights. To report on his experiences in Landstuhl and beyond, uh, I've asked Cliff Jones to give us a presentation of his experiences. Cliff. Thanks, Jens. I think a uh, famous quote from Winston Churchill uh, stated that the only winner in war is medicine. And it seems that uh, this is uh, starting to become more and more prominent uh, for the uh, DOD, uh, the government, and uh, coming out from these uh, war efforts in terms of trying to bring some science to, to these problems. I'd like to also thank a great number of people, part of the DOD, especially Josh Wenke, who provided a lot of these statistics for this talk. I have nothing to disclose and to cover Josh Wenke, Wenke's components, that the, these are just private views of the author and the research group and not the Department of Defense or Army. When you look at the casualties that come from this, that they're usually non-battle related type injuries or combat casualty. From that you can have the wounded in action or killed in action. And of course, trying to look at the medical component of these, from our component, is really the medevac components of the patients that are wounded in action that are able to be brought to a level four or five facility so they can be improved upon and try and get to function back to these people. To date, right now, the U.S. has had almost about 17,000 battlefield injured warriors in operation of Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom that were not able to return to duty. Uh, approximately 16 of the, 1,600 of these wounded in action uh, had approximately 7,000 wounds. Uh, approximately 1,300 of these warriors had more than one extremity wound, 82% of these, and a total of uh, 3,575 extremity wounds in total. The average injured warrior has 2.3 extremity wounds. Most of these are from penetrating soft tissue wounds and open fractures. When you look at the mechanisms of injury from this, you can see that most of these are from the improvised, uh, improvised explosive devices, shrapnel, or explosions, uh, compared to the gunshots, motor vehicle accidents, and landmines. These are the scope of wounds that occur from this, and you can see the battlefield tourniquets that are uh, allowing the uh, bleeding to be decreased and hopefully saving this uh, wounded warrior's life. The thing that's helped also a great deal is this uh, strike face or this body armor that really protects these uh, people here but then exposes the extremities to uh, more injuries in many of these people who wouldn't survive without these. It's somewhat interesting though when you take a look at everything from World War I uh, through all the other skirmishes to uh, the uh, Mideast crisis here that you can see that almost uh, two-thirds of these uh, have the limbs being involved with the uh, accidents and the injuries. When you break this down, <clears throat> approximately 20% are upper extremity, 13% to the spine, 3% to the pelvis, and about two-thirds to the lower extremity, again due to these blast injuries and, the, and from these uh, strike force uh, body armor that you have. You have such things as anti-personal landmines, and you can see the component of the blast effect, the negative pressure, and then the uh, wounds that are uh, both at the direct and indirect sites from the injury. This is in a uh, patient here from Launchstool who was actually a, uh, a Division I tight end for University of Virginia who had a um, multitude of injuries from this. And uh, as a um, thing that they like to do is uh, have uh, the shrapnel being placed in stool uh, or other type things which uh, increase the amount of infection rate that you have from this. You can see the injuries that he had, his uh, upper extremities, uh, his body looks pretty good, but his lower extremities were pretty badly injured. This is his uh, forearm. We can see one of the pellets that was brought out from there and already an infection be beginning to this patient. His uh, right lower extremity, uh, baloney amputation. His uh, open uh, subtroche femur with compartmental syndrome. Uh, pellets into his left uh, acetabular joint. 
And then this is his left upper extremity, the segmental injury wound uh, that he had from that. You can also have small arms projectile paths, which create again the direct component and then the indirect negative uh, cavitary effect from this with the 22 caliber or the uh, other type of uh, weaponry that can be used from this. This is in a uh, patient here that had a uh, high velocity wound to his uh, anterior lateral thigh uh, through his uh, distal femur and then came out of his calf. Uh, amazingly enough, this patient had uh, intact pulses and uh, neural exam. He was uh, provisionally had an external fixator placed in the field and then brought in for further stabilization from there. Somewhat interesting, as you can see from here, that he actually had x-rays. Many times these uh, patients just have printouts uh, from the computer, but you can see the high velocity component of this. The external fixator in position to get preliminary stabilization. And then again, the uh, final radiographs that you can see from here for stabilization of this fracture. And yes, there, you could have used a retrograde nail again. In terms of uh, armor vehicle injuries, uh, this uh, seems to be a, a huge problem at the initial portion of the uh, war effort, which is uh, diminished somewhat now with uh, more protection to these uh, vehicles. Uh, this is an uh, armored personnel carrier you can see from here. The front end of this uh, carrier was uh, demolished. Uh, these are the injuries that usually come in from that in terms of the uh, foot injuries. Uh, this person had no other injuries besides this. This open plantar wound, uh, which I think uh, Steve and Bruce and all the open calcaneal fractures that you see, this is uh, somewhat uncommon. This is the uh, injury pattern in which he was uh, brought to the facility. And then some preliminary uh, stabilization of this to uh, stabilize the soft tissues and uh, begin uh, closure from there. I don't know what the end result is uh, from this uh, concerning his soft tissues, but didn't have much of a uh, calcaneal cuboid joint from there. Another patient with a compartmental syndrome of his foot, again, from this armored uh, personnel carrier. The calcaneal fracture that uh, came from that. So when you take a look at the injury incidents, that about 54% uh, of these are to the extremities. About a third, traumatic brain injury or um, post-traumatic stress disorder. 11% to abdomen, 6% to the thorax. But you can see from this that the um, resource utilization that projected disability cost increases quite quickly from, again, the injury incidents to the amount of utilization that you have from there. So again, the extremities become the long-term type problem uh, for these patients. And so what is the uh, disability due to the battlefield injury? As you can see from this patient here, uh, is quite, quite a few years in the making uh, to uh, try and get this person to be functional. So taking a look at this uh, from about 1,600 combat wounded, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is the other problem that uh, not, of these, uh, not all these patients have complete records where they're either sent uh, to civilian agencies or to different um, uh, places that, within the United States that uh, 464 had an evaluation and then from there 450 complete records to take a look at this to uh, determine the amount of unfitting conditions and the clinical diagnoses associated with that. So again, the numbers even go up higher from that, from the initial 54% incidence utilization in the 60s, and now almost 70% uh, had unfitting conditions based on the extremity compared to all the other parts of the body. 84% of the wounded warriors have at least one orthopedic unfitting condition. And then when you take a look at the rank by count of unfitting conditions that you have, these are the top 10. When you look further at that, the, the number one is degenerative arthritis, uh, nerve loss or function, pain of extremity, lower extremity amputation, back pain, hand condition, or muscle condition. So from this, you have seven of the top ten conditions, unfitting conditions are to the extremities. When you then take a look at rank by the average percent disability from there, this gets to be to the top three are from uh, amputation, back pain, or another amputation to the lower extremity. The, the ninth and tenth are nerve loss or function or hand condition. So when you take a look then further from this in terms of the weighted impact, which is the frequency and the average percent disability from this, again, uh, the extremities become the uh, top amount of uh, injuries that uh, really affect these uh, wounded warriors long term with lower extremity amputation, 
nerve loss and function, degenerative arthritis, and Jens, the spine condition, around now the top four problems for these uh, patients. Otherwise, uh, fit for duty. Uh, from that, you had 50% of these had only an orthopedic injury uh, that created unfitting conditions to allow them to continue with their job and occupation. When you take a look at the comparison of statistics for battle casualties over the years in terms of World War II, Vietnam War, and now the Middle East uh, problems with the Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom, that you can see that the percent mortality of these wounded warriors has been going down and in quite, quite contradistinction to the amount of extremity injuries which continue to be quite high at about two-thirds of all these people. Useful techniques that have been helping during uh, the frontline war surgery that are being looked at even further is hypotensive resuscitation, damage control surgery, use of fresh whole blood, far forward vascular shunts, I think Carlo could probably discuss some in his experience from that. Wound management, especially with the VAC, and additional hemostatic uh, type of techniques. So the bottom line is if you live, orthopedic injuries are a limiting factor. And that the orthopedic injuries are the main barrier to the return to function of these people in addition. So in summary, extremity injuries are the most common injury occurring. And again, two-thirds of all these wounded warriors. The disabilities are higher than the incidence of these. The disability is at 69% versus 54% incidence. It is a barrier return to function. It's responsible for most of the hospital utilization and disability and the main cause of morbidity for these wounded warriors. Any questions? So can you please use a microphone? Yeah, Bruce. I know that the military was working hard on getting a, an injury registry. You know how that's coming? Is it useful and is it accessible to the post-military veteran? The uh, registry is becoming uh, more and more important. I think as you saw from that also, their biggest problem is actually continuity of care for these patients that go from uh, CONUS, uh, you know, from the uh, Middle East to CONUS, then to potential for civilian sites. They're trying to actually incorporate uh, these patients uh, within the government agencies itself and to actually not use the civilian sites uh, to help improve some of these registry components but lagging way behind. Also from that I think that's helped a great deal is actually now some of the uh, funding that's come out which uh, really has lagged behind a lot of these uh, war efforts and I think probably started in 2007 or so which, which is this has become more and more important for them. Um, Dr. Conrad. Uh, Cliff, I'm Chappie Conrad. I enjoyed your talk very much, and it's a humbling uh, topic for most of us to listen to. Can you say something again, a little bit about the initial triage of these young people who are treated, and then what happens with their rehab after, uh, after their treatment and the need for revision procedures? Oh, is that Carlo here right now? No, he's a bit one of the far... Well, many of these, uh, the goal is uh, for these people within, uh, which is different than all these other... Uh, wars and so forth is the time that they get to a um, tertiary center. It's usually within uh, 12 to 24 hours uh, that they're flown out. Usually within 48 hours they go to Landstuhl, Germany, which is a uh, large uh, hospital uh, based in uh, southwest uh, Germany uh, where they have, I believe, six orthopedic surgeons there at all times. Uh, sometimes can be overwhelming, uh, 16 to uh, 20 some admits a day, um, which can be quite problematic. They have two operating rooms uh, and uh, many times we'll operate 24-7 uh, to kind of uh, relieve the ebb and flow of uh, patients that come in from that. And of course, uh, it was the summer of 2007 when they had the surge, it was uh, uh, quite busy uh, for the people that worked there. As soon as they get stabilized from there, both from an extremity component and for a lot of these, the head injury component, they're uh, shipped back to the uh, five uh, main hospitals in the United States where they then undergo their really definitive care. Uh, I think the, the numbers are near close to 100% of every injury that comes back open wound is infected. Uh, that uh, many of the injuries are different than what you see here from a bad open tibia fracture on a motorcycle is nothing compared to these blast wounds that take um, 
five, six, seven, eight, ten debridements before you finally get to a, a component where you can uh, place a metal in. So your thoughts of uh, or rigid early fixation that was uh, really started here years ago is really thrown out uh, because of the fact that anything that's put in in terms of long-term metal becomes infected and uh, quite a problem for them. Uh, they uh, seem to also have a great deal of problems with ectopic bone for the injury to the muscle uh, and sometimes also from the um, uh, bony erosseous procedures that they try and do to uh, uh, save these extremities. There seems to be a much higher percentage of um, Ilozarov type fixators being applied uh, rather than internal fixation and seem to have better results than what we saw here in the United States back in the 90s where uh, the hybrid tape frames were, would had a higher rate of malunion, non-union type of thing and equal rates of infection. For these patients, the rates of infection are much, much, much higher, which really uh, create problems in terms of trying to get to the stabilization from there. And then I think as of um, a year and a half ago now, I think they have now three full-time amputee centers within the United States, I think San Antonio, uh, in Maryland, and I think one other location in Georgia, I believe. Uh, and the long-term component of this is really out in the open uh, concerning some of the further studies. So if you have an amputee, if you ampu have an amputation uh, and you're one of these amputee centers, uh, some of the people's thoughts are that the life coach or the overall environment helps more than actually even the therapy uh, for these types of patients uh, for the long term. Also, they're now getting such devices as uh, waterproof um, uh, above knee amputations, which really helps uh, these uh, patients perform and uh, uh, undo such circumstances from there. Uh, great question. Uh, from my perspective, there were two major things that uh, struck me from an orthopedic perspective. Again, that's aside from the traumatic brain injuries and the whole blood resuscitation, which I saw very aggressively managed them, which may change the way that we do resuscitation here. And I'd like to ask Dr. Bray to come up here also to comment on this. The thing that struck me was how aggressively bone morphogenic protein was used yeah. and how antimicrobial therapy was used from an OTA perspective and from your experience. Can you address those two phenomena which are really just way out of any use that I've ever seen here in the U.S.? Good. Yeah. Well, from the uh, BMP standpoint, uh, I think uh, the term uh, using it like water is probably appropriate. They will use uh, many, many large kits and uh, large amounts and uh, really minimal amounts of, uh, of uh, bone graft or autograft, uh, which seems to um, lend its support from the literature, if you take a look at that, that the rates of uh, infection seem to be less with uh, BMP compared to autograft. And they must use <clears throat> very large doses, uh, I'm sure, to stimulate some of the uh, bone regeneration uh, that you have from that. Um, the other component is the infection component is uh, incredibly aggressive where pretty much everyone is colonized that has anything done uh, near the field uh, initially, and that's really been their biggest problem from uh, these patients long term. Um, I, yeah, I wasn't in uh, Langstall, so I don't have a, a personal experience, but uh, politically, I think the, um, uh, the OTA really doesn't have a position statement on that. Um, I, I think the OTA is very supportive of the U.S. military. We worked uh, hand in hand um, with the uh, comfort uh, down in Haiti. Uh, one of the problems that we found with the, uh, um, with the volunteers, uh, however, was um, that there was some question about the liability of their participation in a, a so-called uh, war zone. Um, it might be that if you contracted AIDS or hepatitis C working down there that your disability life insurance and health, health insurance may be in question. And so um, our um, approach next year will be to, to try to find a larger umbrella to put the OTA, put the OTA under uh, for a little bit better protection like the American Red Cross. Uh, we tried to work with the U.S. Navy and uh, some of our OTA colleagues from uh, North Carolina to see if we could uh, take care of that. But in time of need, we, just, we had a really tough problem uh, taking care of that. So um, I would just say that if any time any of you as orthopedic surgeons decide to volunteer, be sure and, and, and identify that bef before you take on. I mean, we're all very appreciative of your commitment, uh, but just uh, uh, be cautious.
So, uh, Cliff, excellent presentation. And something that didn't come up, I feel obligated to mention. I just had the uh, opportunity at Oral Boards in Chicago to interview a young Navy surgeon who had spent six months in a far, far forward uh, unit and uh, showed his cases. And uh, brings to mind uh, several other individuals that I met, both at Launch Tool and I'm familiar with. Uh, and that is the tremendous toll that, that, this, that these conflicts have taken on the providers. Um, this guy lost 27 Marines in six months, had them, you know, die in front of him, uh, and uh, his psychological toll uh, is tremendous, uh, and he is likely going to have to go back. Many people have been deployed multiple times. There's a Army Reserve orthopedic surgeon who is a resident at the University of Minnesota. He's been deployed three times. He's lost his practice three times in the last four years, and it's something the public is just completely unaware of is... Uh, the amount of sacrifice that the providers are making, and I just felt obligated to bring this up in case somebody's not aware. Yeah, the I, the I toll is huge on marriages, on families. I think in my uh, experience when I was there is the fact that it uh, could be from the travel and so forth, but pretty much didn't sleep the first week and didn't realize that later in terms of the, um, the volume of really sick 20-year-old people was amazing. Okay, moving right along, it's uh, again my pleasure again to introduce another giant in orthopedics. I feel a special kinship with Larry because Larry has lived, grown up and lived and worked in Buffalo for a number of years and having lived in Jackson, we both have figured out how to go where no one else wants to go and, and be successful at it. So <laughs> Larry is, uh, grew up in Buffalo, went to medical school in Buffalo and then did a general surgery residency under John Border in Buffalo again. Then he did, uh, tired of general surgery and decided to do orthopedic surgery and did orthopedic surgery in Dallas. There he was with some, taught some great people as uh, Jens Chapman and Brad Henley. And then after that, in 1986, he returned to Buffalo to, be, uh, to do orthopedic trauma. Currently, he is the uh, professor and chairman of orthopedics at, at the University of Buffalo. He's formerly served as an OTA president. He's been on the AAS board as well. And what you may not know, he is an avid skier and a 15-year uh, let's see, 15 years into a periastatabular osteotomy, and it's working out great for him. So please well, join me in welcoming Larry. Thanks, George. I, I first want to uh, thank Jens for inviting me here. Uh, when I heard that uh, this meeting was going to honor Ted, I didn't have the privilege of doing a residency or fellowship here, but I do have the privilege of knowing Ted for over 30 years. Ted's one of those people, and I don't need to tell any of you, uh, that you know when you meet him. It's like when JFK was shot. I know when I met Ted. I know, I know the exact moment where I was. And he uh, graciously allowed me to be part of his uh, mentorship. He took me under his very large wing. And over many years, we taught AO courses together. And as a junior faculty member, he would bring me along and, and, and teach me a great deal about how to deal with the trauma patient. The, um, the talk today is on um, my experience in Haiti, but it's not my own experience. I have three colleagues that were on the USS Comfort with me. John Keeve is here, uh, Dave Teague and Mark Swinkowski were all part of this uh, 10 uh, person, I was going to say 10 man, but we had uh, uh, Laura Perkowski with us, who were fortunate enough to uh, be able to volunteer to go down to Haiti and work on the USNS Comfort uh, and take care of an incredible group of patients that um, needed us immensely. Jens wanted me to talk a little bit about what it's like to volunteer um, and every one of us will have a different emotional attachment to that. This was my first time doing it. Uh, John has done many of these, and, and Tim Weber told me he's done several. We do it for different reasons, and we take away uh, a great deal from it. I don't know that I can really tell you how it has affected me, but it, it certainly has. One of the, one of the greatest um, benefits was working with this group of orthopedic trauma surgeons that I'll show you shortly. Uh, people that I've known all my trauma life and that I've taught many, many courses with, 
but never had the opportunity to uh, be quite so intimate. We, we all walked away with a camaraderie uh, that we had a sense of what the uh, military infantry uh, person, soldier, must feel like after uh, being with their platoon or squad over many months working together. We ate and slept and worked and thought and talked for two weeks as one. And the, the entire experience was, was really something. Um, most of this is um, a kind of show and tell. I have many, many slides, uh, but I wanted to give you a, a sense of what we, had, what we saw there and what we had to deal with. Uh, when you start to see the x-rays, uh, first of all, we did not have standard um, pre-op x-rays on every patient. There were just too many and too much work to do. Our post-op x-rays were almost non-existent because there wasn't time for it. Um, the, um, the comfort is, is based in, in um, Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, it was um, commissioned to get to Haiti uh, about two days after the earthquake when they realized they needed to help. Generally, the comfort takes five to seven days to be mobilized and, and deployed. They left port 48 hours after they were told to go. They were severely understaffed and under-equipped and uh, did not really understand what they were getting themselves into. And I'll show you the figures in a moment. But what they did have in their back pocket was the OTA. And as Tim alluded to, um, they asked for our help. And fortunately, for those of us who had been in launch tool, where we were credentialed through the Army, we were able with some arm twisting to get credentialed um, with the Navy to allow us to, to get on board. Um, the Comfort arrived on the 19th, um, actually the 18th, and immediately uh, started to receive severe casualties. In the first five weeks, they had over 800 admissions, severe trauma patients that you'll see uh, from newborns to 89-year-olds with 90% with of the admissions having one or more, and you'll see m multiple fractures in, 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 one, in one person. Um, for the first 48 hours, they were bringing in a helicopter every six to, to nine minutes. They filled up um, a hospital the size of uh, Harborview in a matter of a week. With a fairly skeleton crew at that time, they had uh, three or four orthopedic surgeons, only one of which was trauma trained. They had uh, an OBGYN, two neurosurgeons, two general surgeons, an ENT, and a plastic surgeon there. Um, the, the obstetricians were doing amputations because they could. Um, this doesn't add up to 630, but it gives you a sense of what they had to, to deal with in a very short order. Uh, we, we came on board. Um, three weeks after they were there, we, we were there uh, February 3rd, after some delay due to this credentialing problem that we had to, to deal with. And they had over 100 patients waiting for us. And then I'll show you a, a slide that they brought in another 25 or 30 a day um, the whole time we were there. Here's the comfort. It is the size of three football fields. It's 10 uh, stories high. It's bigger than an aircraft carrier. The helicopters were flying night and day, um, bringing them, uh, bringing injured patients, uh, the standard bed in my roomies over here, um, and on a very small um, flight deck. But one of, the, one of the nurses said she was on that flight deck for the first uh, 48 hours and didn't have time to pee or eat. Uh, they kept coming so, so rapidly. And, and I, I emphasize this because they, they did an incredible job with a very limited number of, of staff for the size of the, um, of the problem. It really was enormous. You've seen this picture. This is the palace uh, that uh, you saw on TV over and over again. It is uh, situated in um, Port-au-Prince here, and you can uh, see the entire street in front and back of it with every building was damaged. And that's, of course, as you realize, the 
the type of injury that we were seeing was not the motorcycle or the fall from a roof or the car accident. These people were crushed. And the, the uh, fracture pattern and the, the, the combination of injuries, for me, was quite, was quite significant and different than what we were used to. That's what they used to. Um, this is what they used to, to live in, which all fell down because of the poor quality of their building. And this is what they were living in when we were there. The people, however, um, most of them were on the street. Um, they were afraid to go back into houses even when they were um, uh, pronounced safe. Um, the University of Buffalo has an earthquake center and, and people from UB went down there and uh, looked at uh, buildings and said you could go back in and they refused to, um, being afraid that it would all happen over again. But the people were, were uh, well dressed and they appeared well fed, um, very happy, uh, happy to have us help them, which I'll show you shortly. This is the type of slum that many of them uh, lived in and still do today. The um, rebar in these uh, concrete buildings was inferior. It, it, they, they just weren't uh, built to withstand uh, the magnitude of this earthquake, even though everyone knows that uh, they are on a fault line. Here's some patients in actually the dining hall uh, during one evening when there was a celebration for a Haiti um, uh, holiday. This is, uh, you'll see this one again, but this is one of many pelvises that, that we dealt with. Uh, I'll show you shortly. We, uh, three of us worked in one of the rooms, and it was sort of um, like Groundhog Day. It was just another pelvis that looked just like the last three we did yesterday, and et cetera, et cetera, for days on end. And the sad uh, picture of an upper extremity amputation. But here's a young lady who's, who's going to go in and have her femur fixed. Um, quite very happy um, population. They, um, they, we didn't speak their language, they didn't speak ours. We had interpreters throughout. Um, and at the end, we would ask, do you understand what we're going to do? And they basically said, uh, we put our hands in God and, and let us t take care of them. One of the babies born on the comfort and one of the patients coming in from the island after having initial external fixation. A sad child who uh, was uh, pinned between two pieces of concrete for a period of time, but actually ends up doing quite, quite well. An intensive care baby, another smiling, happy face, even with their injuries. This is the intensive care unit. They had 90 intensive care beds. Um, and the, while well, they had over 900 uh, hospital beds, they, some of those were, were uh, taken up by family members. So their census was around 500 at any one time. Uh, this is um, on the floor with the operating room and the intensive care unit. These patients are on their way back to the island. Uh, the doors in, in the back there lead either up or down. They go down a ramp to um, a, an opening where, the, where, the, where you can get on a boat or you go up to the flight deck. And this is the uh, casually receiving area. There were 40 uh, beds that um, we unfortunately weren't, weren't there to deal with on a daily basis. But when they first came, uh, this was an absolute madhouse. And here's the 10 of us. Um, I think you know most of them. If, um, if not, on, the, on your far left, that's Mike uh, Wattenberger or Waddy. Uh, he's a, a Parkland product, and, and uh, uh, he does pediatric uh, orthopedics in, in, um, with Mike Bossy and Jim Kellum. He came along to uh, help the neurosurgeons do the spine. And John Keeve is there, uh, Brandon Patterson, Dave Teague. Mike Bossy, who we called the, the Admiral. We were very, very fortunate that Mike was around. Uh, Mike actually was in charge of the orthopedics uh, on the comfort during Desert Storm as um, when he was in the Navy and obviously knew his way around very well. Mark and, and um, uh, Laura Przluski and Peter Trafton and Josh Duke. We figured there was probably 250 years of uh, trauma experience in those 10, 10 people. Uh, it was um, my 
great pleasure to be able to, to sit around with these guys for two weeks and, and talk trauma and talk patients and scrub in and, and have Mark Swinkowski work a C-arm for me. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty special thing. Uh, Peter Trafton, um, this was our first night. We came in on a Wednesday on the 3rd and went through some preliminary uh, um, stuff that you got to go through on the boat on, on the 4th. And then they said, well, we've got these 100 patients. How do you want to take care of them? Uh, we split up into two groups. And uh, uh, wouldn't you know it, but the, uh, the three former OTA presidents said, oh, I'll work at night. So with, with Laura on board, uh, Peter, uh, Mark, and uh, Mike worked uh, from about 8 to, to 6 in the morning, and then the rest of us filled in uh, running five rooms all day. And over a four-day period, we finished off the 100 plus um, those 25 or 30 that they kept coming in. And of course, like every hospital, there's a lot of downtime. This is um, the entire group. They, they flew in uh, some additional Ar um, Air Force and Navy Ortho, general orthopedists that, that um, uh, we gave a hand to during the surgery. All told, there was 19 of us when we finally um, left two weeks later. The operating room could have been any operating room in any major trauma center or hospital in the country. Um, while we were on a ship, we had no idea we were on a ship. Uh, one day we went outside uh, at a break and the ship had turned 180 degrees into the wind and we had no idea it even moved. It was so big and so stable that um, it, uh, it worked fine. The um, interesting thing is that when they did first get to, um, to, the, to the harbor, they were totally um, under-supplied, and they sent, when they asked for OTA members to come, they also asked for some, some uh, equipment. And it's hard to believe, but the U.S. government within uh, five days sent them six million dollars worth of equipment, three, three or four new uh, sea arms. Um, the red tape got cut through pretty quickly. This is the, 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 the pre-op area just outside the OR. Um, this was the room 12. It was the pelvic and acetabular room I'm, I'm helping. The young man in the middle is, um, is Christian um, Mamzak. He's uh, two years out of a trauma fellowship in, uh, in the Navy. And, uh, and he said this was like having a second fellowship all over again. That's Brandon Patterson and myself. We had a lot of com camaraderie. Uh, John is going through some pictures here, I think. All these pictures, by the way, are, are um, a conglomerate from all of us. Even the, uh, we had um, uh, nurses and anesthesiologists from uh, Project Hope and, uh, and uh, whatever the smile one is. Um, and uh, we all got, a, got together and got the pictures, and John Keeve was, uh, uh, I thank John for sending me, most of these to me. This was the um, radiology room. It was a little bitty cubicle where the radiologist sat, and we um, met there at least twice a day, uh, morning and evenings, and, and looked over the cases, decided what needed to be done and who would do it, um, and uh, went about our business. My, uh, I had a little bit of concern the first day. Uh, there's a lot of alpha males sitting in that room, and I was wondering how it was all going to work out, but it was um, a delight. Just I, I told you, there's a lot of... But this is just a sample of uh, a day's uh, morning's work almost. This is only one side of the board. But, um, you know, two pelvises, uh, three, four, five femurs, two burst fractures, a couple of inner trochs, uh, subtroke, and um, that's, that was a day's work. That was a part of a day's work. Uh, we did, the, the ship did um, enough trauma to um, um, be a whole year's work in most trauma centers. The uh, daily census, once they got up to speed, uh, you see here, and then the admissions. We came in on the third, and uh, they had, um, as you see, uh, 15, 21, 19, 27, and that was on top of the 100-some that w they had waiting for us. So they did it, an unbelievable job. Um, w one day, we, um, I didn't go, but one day some of, of the 10 of us went on, on the island and, and, and looked for um, uh, 
patients that we could, we could treat, some, some triage. This was about four weeks out uh, for the comfort. And um, this is the uh, Miami um, Tent Hospital. Um, they did a great job of doing what they could do, but um, it, it was not a place to really operate. As you'll see here, this is sort of an open air amputation, but they did what they could and we have to hand it to them. There were many of these um, uh, 10 hospitals around trying to, to do the best they could. We were very fortunate that the comfort was so well supplied. The military was, was huge um, for us. Not only did the um, Corps of Engineers build this pier, but we had transport, we had security. Uh, this is the boat that took us out to the comfort and to deal with patients like this and this. Yeah. So I, this is really, you know, stuff that uh, we're, we're not used to seeing, fortunately. Many of the, like I say, many of the x-rays, we don't have um, good post-ops because it just wasn't time. It, we just couldn't spend our time. Um, it was all done through image, which we use for all. Uh, this is not our work, but this is one of the patients that was sent in to us. S they tried, you know, they, they, they had a rod, they had a tibia, and they said, well, let's see if we can, we can put it down. But with no, without a C-arm, um, it, uh, it often didn't work, and there's, there's several of those. This was a much better way of doing it, a uh, temporary X-fix, and, and the, uh, uh, the surgeon was even kind enough to send the wrench along with, with it so we could get it off. Uh, this is what we saw, many of these, these are, this is three or four weeks out, uh, partially healed, and so every case that, that we did we had to take down. Uh, there was no closed reductions per se, although some of the femurs um, we could uh, shake loose, um, and so we didn't have to open everything, but another case from the, from the island that uh, didn't, didn't last very long. But um, femoral neck shaft, segmental, there's that case again. Another floating knee. Lots and lots of pelvises. I think uh, Christian said there's like 35 pelvises that he did in six weeks. And, uh, and you can see that the bridging callus is already starting to, to, uh, to form there. Another attempt to nail a femur. Um, they had a rod, they had a femoral fracture. Only problem was it didn't fit quite right. But I, I wasn't there. I, um, I, I was fortunate to, to be on the comfort. Acetabular fracture, hip dislocation, and a femoral shaft fracture. Lots of interesting combinations like such. Don't see these too many in your lifetime. We saw them all in, or they saw them all in five weeks. We saw some of them in the two weeks we were there. Interestingly, um, they didn't spend much time with Jude views. They get a pelvis, see that it was fractured or dislocated and they go right to the CT scan because we, it, it was quicker and we could do 3D reconstructions and um, and find out a heck of a lot more than without wasting time for the spine surgeons. I'm taking down one of those super condylers. Another pelvis. Crescent fractures. We did a lot of them. Um, towards the end, we got a little we got a little gun shy. We were five weeks out on some of them, and we, we, we debated whether it was worth it because whether we could get them down or not. Um, some of the older folks, um, you know, 45 to 50, we decided not to. The average life expectancy for a Haitian male or Haitian adult is uh, 55 years of age. So we said, well, the, uh, a shoe lift, and they'll do fine for the next five years. But the kids, all the teenagers, we um, we did our best. This, I think, is the case you saw Bossy, uh, uh, Brandon, myself, and, and, and Christian scrubbed in on it. It took four of us to master this one.
pretty standard there, except that it, it's, it's, a, it's a long time out. But it was all worth it when you see these kids going back with their whatever fixed. And um, uh, the experience was um, uh, something that I, like I say, it's hard for me to put into words. I was blessed to be able to, to, to be on board and be part of it. Uh, it will um, stimulate me to become more of a volunteer in the future. And um, what we brought away from, from this, of course, was um, the need to have uh, some sort of database through the DOD uh, and the OTA and, uh, and other organizations, as Tim was, was, was mentioning, so that we can be credentialed at the time of the, of the uh, disaster, wherever it is or whatever it is, so we can get there sooner than we got there for, uh, for the comfort. But fortunately, we were able to help. Thank you. Dr. Manson is going to talk about North American trauma centers and their impact. So in 1961, uh, R.A. Cowley, who was a thoracic surgeon, uh, had come back from the military. And he had learned in the military a concept that he popularized, which said that if you could get a severely injured patient treated and stabilized within the first hour, that they had a chance to survive injuries that were otherwise considered unsurvivable. In 1961, he established a two-bed research unit at the University of Maryland, and the results were so poor that it became known in the hospital as the death lab, because anybody set up there usually died. He didn't give up, however. He kept persisting, and in 1968, he uh, established a 32-bed unit in 1989, an eight-story institute was established, and he had the fortune in the early 60s of taking care of the governor's daughter who was severely injured, and she's one of the patients in the death lab who survived. And that made the difference because the governor bought him a helicopter system, and the governor uh, gave him the money through the legislature to establish this system, and R.A. Cowley is seen there on your left. Now, Maryland has benefited immensely from R.A., and I have too. He, was, um, he did a lot of uh, things that I consider visionary. He was a pioneer in hyperbaric oxygen. He... Uh, invented a pacemaker. If you look at uh, his contributions, they're the typical individual who is very successful. They're just everywhere. Well, as I said, the governor put this system on the map, and he gave it a helicopter system, which I think made the big difference in getting patients to, um, to Baltimore. And the state of Maryland is divided into these um, areas, these six areas, and essentially, you can go from anywhere to Baltimore within an hour because of the uh, rapid helicopter transport. So we established the typical administrative overstructure, which is cumbersome, but the key was that R.A. Cowley directed this and was independent of the politicians. And the mandate of the system was to become the state's emergency medical services system and they became the primary adult trauma clinical resource center. So this is the current existing building, and there's a new one in construction that's going to add to this, but it's seven stories. Uh, it has 13 trauma bays that accommodate 26 patients, six dedicated ORs, a number of ICU and acute beds, and some hyperbaric beds. So this system provided an immense opportunity for specialists to become good at what they do. And the critical care people, the orthopedists, the plastic surgeons, they all could become good at what they do through the uh, great experience that was enjoyed there. Currently, uh, we take about 7,500 admissions a year. Uh, about two-thirds of those are either by um, ambulance or helicopter. And um, the trauma trends, we have the same uh, etiologies of trauma admissions as you probably do. 
the motor vehicle still accounts for a lot, as do uh, interpersonal violence. So we do about 5,352 cases a year. And the amazing thing about this unit is that um, if I want to take a patient in the middle of the night to the operating room, I just say I do for some elective skin graft, and the, the answer is never no. Um, these are the other centers that participate in this trauma system. And there are eye care centers, there are pediatric care centers, there are uh, other ancillary trauma centers who deal with many, many patients, but then send the sickest ones or the, those that need the acute multi-specialty care to the shock trauma unit. And there's also a hand center at uh, Union Memorial Hospital. We've been working to try to reduce the number of patients refused because volume is a problem. And hopefully we can get that number down even lower, but for the last few years it's been 50 or less. This gives you an idea of some of the volume handled by the other uh, regional centers, um, and uh, they do a great job at taking care of a lot of the less complicated trauma victims. Well, we've begun to cooperate on a national level, as I'm sure you have, and with the military in training the military because unfortunately if we're not at war there isn't a good place to train military surgeons. And we've run into funding problems and fortunately they've been um, partially solved by the institution of an annual motor vehicle registration fee and a tax on gas. And a part of that goes to fund the infrastructure and the buildings and the treatment of the patients, but a part of it goes to fund the doctors because the doctors can't be expected to do all this work for nothing. They've got to be paid for what they do and they deserve to be paid for what they do. So I hope um, I can see much more progress in this area. So by virtue of some commitment, some state support, and some public support, uh, trauma care is alive and well in the East. Now I asked my son who um, began to work as an orthopedic surgeon at the shock trauma unit about a year ago. I said, why do we need these trauma centers? And I thought it might be interesting to get his perspective. He did a trauma fellowship at shock trauma and then he did a year at HSS to try to prepare himself for this job. And these are the things he listed. He said, for simple fractures, we're good at what we do frequently. But once you get to the stage where you need coordination between services for multiple in, injured patients and limb salvage scenarios, complex fracture par, patterns, that's really what you need uh, a trauma center for. And he said it's hard to prove that surgeon volume predicts outcome in orthopedic trauma. However, the statement makes intuitive sense to most surgeons, especially in complex fracture patterns. These are, I said, well, give me some examples. He said, well, like acetabular fractures, pylon fractures, the surgeon needs specialized training for definitive care of these injuries. So the two examples he gave me were acetabular fractures, which you see here, and these patients are often very sick. And then he said, here's an example of a patient who really shouldn't have lived. 25-year-old male, unrestrained driver, motor vehicle accident, Western Maryland, 45 minutes to extricate him from the car, liver laceration, splenic laceration, a floating knee injury, no distal pulses. He bypasses the uh, local level one trauma center and is brought to shock trauma where there's a coordinated team of general vascular and orthopedic surgeons on call ready to take care of him. So his coags are off, his temperature is down, he's in shock, he's got a head injury, shows contusion and hemorrhage, but all of that is available to be managed. And here I think is the contribution that trauma centers make. They can stop the hemorrhage, they do compartment releases, they do damage control, external fixator, reestablish distal perfusion with a reverse saphenous vein graft, the general surgeons there do several emergent x laps per month. They have no elective schedule. They sit there and they're ready to deal with patients. They don't have to be called in or don't have to be taken away from another case. 
The orthopedic surgeon sees an open tibia fracture every night, does a damage control femoral frame at least once a month, and the vascular surgeon is interested in trauma rather than seeing call as a burden. And this is, I think, the difference. So he gets rapid fasciotomies, the X-fix prior to physiological stabilization. And they decide as a group when the patient is safe to go back to the OR for definitive reconstruction. The two groups of surgeons see each other every day. They make rounds together. They communicate. And they have these patients in common. So that coordination allows you to uh, bring these patients back, do a fem effective femoral nailing after physiologic stabilization. Uh, the tibial nailing is performed as well. And the plastic surgeon gets involved in then providing definitive coverage of these soft tissue wounds. So the combination, I think, of communication between these very talented specialists is what makes trauma centers worthwhile. Our clinics are 20 feet for each other. So if somebody has a question, when can we start knee and ankle range of motion without endangering the flap? Answer, walk 20 feet and ask. So I thank you for being able to provide a little bit of Eastern perspective. Um, I'm extremely impressed with what you all have done here and particularly with your energy and enthusiasm. Thank you.